Mel Brown and I'm the Community Engagement Librarian Sustainability at Hobson's Bay Libraries and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's EnviroCentre event. Now I would like to begin by acknowledging that depending on where you join me from tonight we are potentially gathered on the traditional lands of many peoples. From my home I host you from the lands of the Marinbullock, a clan of the Wurundjeri people and I would like to pay respect to their elders past, present and future as well as those of the wider Kulin Nation whose boundaries cover the Hobson's Bay City Council area, where many of you are likely joining us from tonight. But not excluding all traditional owners whose lands we may be communally standing on this evening. Council acknowledges that long before this area was known as Hobson's Bay, our First Nations people had named its places, hosted ancient ceremonies where learning flourished, where knowledge and resources were exchanged, and where healthy communities and relationships were sustained and adapted to the changing environments. We recognise the unique role that diverse Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples from many lands continue to play in the life of our city. We pay homage to that this evening, coming together to learn and to share, to sustain and to adapt. So I'm just going to let a few more, yep, they've come in, excellent. So just tonight, as I've already said, we are going to be recording um, and we might take some snapshots of the audience as well. So if you don't want to be in any of these, uh, feel free to turn your cameras off. Otherwise, we'd love you to leave them on. Uh, we will be muting people so that there's no background noise. Uh, but when we get to the Q&A at the end, please feel free to unmute yourself. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, so what I would like you to do, if you've got a question halfway through, if you want to pop it in the chat, I'm going to keep track of those questions and then at the end uh, we'll come back. Um, and during tonight's session as well, Katrina might say, might stop at different sections and ask if there's any questions along the way as well. Um, if you would prefer not to ask your question yourself, um, but you still want a quick question asked, that's perfectly fine. Pop it in the chat and just say you'd rather me ask it for you and I can do that for you as well. So this event has been brought to you today by Hobson's Bay Libraries and the Enviro Centre. Um, I would just like to give you a very quick update on what's going on with the library. Um, in line with State Government Roadmap for Reopening, announced last Sunday, the 6th of September, there are again changes to our library service. So all of our return shoots at Hobson's Bay Library, all branches will reopen on Monday, the 14th of September. That have been closed. Um, during the state of disaster. So they're, they're reopening Monday the 14th. Anything you currently have on loan has been extended until the 26th of October. So you don't have to worry about renewing. Even once the shoots do reopen, you don't need to rush down and return what you've got on loan. We've extended all that to the 26th of September. And if you've been wondering about the book a book delivery, we weren't able to do our deliveries during the state of disaster. And that will also restart on Monday the 14th of September. So we're really excited to get books back out to your homes again. Keep in mind, if you're going to do an order now, we do have a bit of a backlog from when we closed. Um, so just keep in mind that we will get them out to you as soon as we can. Um, but our book delivery has been really popular. So um, just be patient. We'll get them all out as soon as we can. But give us a call. Our phone lines are still being answered between 9 and 5, Monday to Friday. Um, so you can jump on, give us a call and have a chat to us at any time during the week. Now tonight's event though is of course why we're all here. We know in the last six months gardening and particularly food gardening around the world has become a popular pastime. Uh, nurseries, hardware stores, seed suppliers, even chook breeders have been struggling to keep up with the extra demand. I've dabbled in growing food myself for a little while and providing habitat plants for my local wildlife but never as much as I have in the last six months like many of you no doubt. So last year I looked at my garden and I thought where are the bees? I've got all this, I've been putting all this time into growing food crops and I realised I had no bees in the backyard and then I went down to my neighbours and saw all the bees on all of her lavender and so I made a bit of a challenge to steal the neighbourhood bees and I, I think I've succeeded because I've got bees in my backyard this year and it's so exciting. Um, 
so I'm hoping that some of you may have potentially also been um, lacking the good bugs in our garden, but also been thwarted by the bad bugs. The, um, the cabbage moth caterpillars are the ones that um, do me in, but I've planted some nasturtium and that's working well for me at the moment. Um, but I'm really excited to hear what Katrina from Buzz and Dig has to tell us tonight. And I hope all of you are as well. So on that note, I'm going to pass over to Katrina. Unmute yourself because I think I managed to mute you in the process of muting everybody else there as well, Katrina. Okay, evening everyone and welcome to the Good Bugs and Bad Bugs session. Um, I could talk for hours about bugs or insects, but um, first of all, I'd like to do an acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm teaching from tonight, and that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also to acknowledge that the Wurundjeri people, like all First Nations people across Australia, have a deep and positive connection to land and to um, everything it contains. And I think this reflects in the, the respect and obviously the diversity we have in, in all the plants and animals we see today in Australia. So welcome um, to this session. My name is Katrina Forstner, as Mel mentioned, and I'd like to say thanks, Mel, for hosting this through Hobson's Bay Libraries. Uh, I want to debunk in this section the theory of bad bugs. I think all bugs have a place in this world, so let me get started. But first of all, my workshops mainly are to promote biodiversity in the backyard. And I want to tease apart those two words. And, and this is really important, especially when we're thinking of increasing beneficial insect populations in our own gardens. So if you think about it, biodiversity in Hobson's Bay or any urbanised area, what does that actually mean? Well, if it's a healthy biodiversity, it's still about supporting in a system a variety of plants and animals and fungi and microorganisms which will create a, a balance, if we will. So that's why I'm saying, you know, think of good bugs or bugs in some way can be good bugs. Um, but if we're in an urbanised area, and if you are thinking of looking down in your garden through the eyes of the bug, what do you actually see? Well, you probably see the similar what I see in Preston lots of roofs, lots of roads and footpaths and ovals and swimming pools and golf courses and all these areas um, for a lot of insects, especially our native pollinators, are not such great places in terms of habitat and places to find a reliable food source. We live in an urbanised area, but we can make a difference with local biodiversity. So I know um, in in your area, you have a lot of waterways. You have um, Cherry Creek, Kuroit Creek, you are bounded by the Yarra River. Whilst all these waterways provide amazing corridors for um, biodiversity in the area, and of course you've got wetlands and reserves, it's a, if we think about the whole um, biogeographical -geog area, it's all fragmented. It's like grandma's quilt. We have patchworks of reserves and parklands and these areas need to be connected together in the local neighbourhood and your garden has a part to play. So when we think about backyard, for us, of course, we define it by boundary walls and fences of, of our property, but for insects and, of course, for birds and a lot of mammals and reptiles, they don't see these boundaries. So I want to plant that little seed in your head tonight to think that when I talk about backyard or when you start thinking about backyard, I want you to think about backyard being your local area, your local neighbourhood. Where is your local park? How far is it from your home? We've been walking around a lot during lockdown. Where is your local creek? Where is your local reserve? Where's your local community garden? All these places are so important in supporting local and healthy insect populations, especially our native pollinators, to have pollinator stepping stones throughout the neighbourhood. So think of your backyard, not just that place behind that back door in your garden. It is the local neighbourhood that connects us to all those open spaces. And 
what better way to start with looking at insects? Now, as home gardeners, we are so fortunate. As Mel said, we've been out in the garden for the last six months, tenderly, tenderly looking after plants. When it's a little bit sunny, we can move them towards the sun. We're going to have the best tomato crops this year, I think. Uh, and if we think about it in Melbourne, we've probably got about 3.5 million gardeners who can all play a part in increasing local biodiversity because they they get to know their plants. They get to know the, the right growing conditions, the right soils. They're able to look after little seedlings and plants when there's not enough rain they're able to move them towards the sun as i mentioned or, or shelter them from the wind and we can all do this so much better than say maybe um vic parks or state parks or even our council rangers and bush crew to look after tiny baby plants and all us melbourne gardeners we are so passionate about gardening. Our thumbs are almost turning green, I think, after six months. But we can all play a part because we can support a lot of local endemic species that have grown traditionally on the grasslands and, and in salty marshes like salty marshes. And they these are the plants that are suited for our native pollinators in our area. And this network of home gardens, um, like the parklands, like your local nursery, like your community garden, are so important in building up that critical biomass and, and helping all these little insects travel around the neighbourhood. And just to give you an example, now we know the honeybee that's probably been visiting your garden that you see at the moment. We know when the honeybee goes foraging for, for flowers from um, the hive can travel two to three kilometers. And in survivalist mode can travel up to 10 kilometers away from the hive looking for food. However, our native bees in Melbourne are so much smaller and they can only travel between 80 metres and 350 metres from their little nest. So they can't go that far. So this is what we really got to hone in tonight, that we got to look after our local insect populations. And, you know, I think bugs are great. I'm just going to show you one resource, and I hope I'm not in reverse on this, but this is a fantastic book to read during lockdown. It's by Anne Sverdrup Feigessen. I hope you've got it in the library. It's called The Extraordinary Insects. I highly recommend this book. I'm not an entomologist. I think this is perfectly written um, for anyone who's interested about insects because it's about the weird and the wonderful. It's about the indispensable insects of the world. These are the ones, she says, who run our world, and it is really true. We, I hope I can get you passionate about some insects. Really recommend this read. Hopefully it's um, high on the reserves list for your, for your book smell. Um, so what, what's so great about these insects? Well, a lot of people call them bugs. I don't like using the word bugs because often bugs also people think of worms and snails, but they're not actually insects. Insects are defined by having six legs. Um, let's go into a few facts and figures about insects. So if I were to hold all of the human population on one hand, and I was to hold all the insect population on one hand around the world, which, if this were uh, a set of scales, which hand do you think would be heavier, the insects or the people? I can see some kids there discussing. It, and a bear, yep. It's actually the insects. The insects would be heavier. There are more insects, to tell you the truth, Per person, there's one billion insects per person. There's so many insects. It's a vast number of insects. 90% of all species in the world are insects. One out of five species named is a beetle. And in Australia alone, we have 500,000 different species of animals and 50% are insects. And 
only a quarter of them are named. There's so many insects in Australia waiting to be discovered. So it's estimated 100,000 different species are out there waiting to be named. You could go out there in your garden and find a new species. Unfortunately, we can't name species after ourselves, but we could name them after our mum or our favourite fo footy player, uh, whatever we want to name them after. But we really need to get out there with our biodiversity goggles on and have a close look at what's happening in our garden. But why are we creeped out by insects? Well, they can be really unpredictable. They have terrible bedside manners. They have terrible table side manners. Uh, they often rock up at our barbecues and picnics uninvited. We often find them in our pantries, in our houses, on our pets. And their behaviour can be, quite frankly, appalling. So if you think about it, sometimes they're walking on our food and, of course, some of them bite or sting. And very few actually carry diseases, but the most dangerous animal in the world is an insect. It's the mosquito. So, you know, I think the thing with insects is they look very different from us. A lot of them um, have several eyes, they have movable um, mouthpieces, they have maybe antennae, and they have that exoskeleton, some have wings, and of course, you know, they have six legs, they look very, very different from us. We can't make insects as cute as we can compared to mammals. We can't anthropomorphise insects. So they're kind of just simply two different As I said, I think insects in general do an amazing thing to our gardens. And in this, in this session, I'm going to show you some really cool things about insects, but my passion is native bees. So we're actually going to start looking at some ID of native bees and some other beneficial insects. And hopefully this session will just inspire you to get out in the garden tomorrow and have a closer look of what's actually out there and, and lives in your garden or your local park. So I'm going to share my screen now because I want to tell you about the um, three things insects or the unsung heroes in our garden are actually doing. So hopefully this is working fine. Okay, is that good? Yep, I yep. can see yep. that. Okay, so um, the first thing is insects are really important in our ecosystems for breaking down, whoops, sorry, there we are, for breaking down organic matter, for breaking down things that are rotting. So this is really important for us to get healthy soils. And it's part of that nutrient recycling. So if you think about the next time you're in a garden, you look under a log or some tan bark, one of the things that's really common you find in the garden are slaters. So they are integral for breaking down lots of wood and sticks and so forth. And if we didn't have these insects, we would be walking around on mountains of rotting matter. And it's the same, a lot of insects are breaking down um, dead animals such as ants and wasps. We would just have so much refuse, natural refuse piled up if it wasn't broken down by these insects. So of course we've got slaters doing a lot of hard work in our gardens. And of course we've got earwigs. Now a lot of gardeners consider these, both of these insects as pests. But I see them as friends because they're out there breaking down all, all my um, wood chips into smaller pieces, which eventually are adding carbon to my soil. So they're really, really important in my garden. The thing we find is that if they sort of take over the garden, that's when we call them the bad bugs. But if we let maybe nature do its course and let maybe some of the predators of these insects come in, then of course, we are able to supply an invaluable food source and keep the population in check with a lot of these insects. So a lot of our other natural recyclers, of course, are beetles. So this is a beautiful Christmas beetle. And often we get really confused what beetle larvae look like. So some of you will notice, especially at this time of the year when the soil is warming up in your garden, you get lots of those white 
fat little larvae. And they're actually beetle larvae. Some people call them witchetty grubs. That is a type of beetle larvae. So a lot of those beetle larvae could potentially be the babies of the Christmas beetle. So I'm just trying to get you to think about not seeing maybe those things a lot of people call um, lawn curl grub as a pest, but perhaps they are um, the babies of these guys, which have, you know, their numbers have been decimated over the past few decades. This was um, something really common when I was a kid. I would collect these at school. They're really hard to come by in urban Melbourne now. And um, the main thing also that we've got to think about is that a lot of these insects, including the larvae, provide a valuable food source. So if we think in the food web, if we think of those trophic levels of energy, at one of the bottom levels are insects. And it's because of the, all those number of species, but also the sheer volume in populations of insects, they provide a lot of energy for visitors in to nest, really hungry, looking for insects in our garden. We've also got other insects in our garden, such as hoverflies at the moment, hovering around, looking for aphid. And of course, we've got things such as parasitic wasps and parasitoid wasps, which I'll talk about, um, how they're an excellent cleanup crew in your garden. So please, if you start seeing a few insects coming, that's because naturally the populations are increasing on the onset of spring. And this is a natural process that's happening in an ecosystem or our gardens at the moment. So it's really important to think of not only the Maggie that flies into your garden, but also the Maggies that are living in the, your local reserve or park or local wetlands that are looking for a reliable food source in the area. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is the third main reason insects are integral in our ecosystem and that is for the pollination services. So you'll see here this is a beautiful bee shot I've taken of one of my artichokes in my garden and you'll notice all this white part is the pollen and it's literally going to cover the bee when the bee visits this flower and the bee will transfer those pollen granules from the anthers of the flower, the male parts of the flower, take them to another flower and drop a few of the pollen grains off into the flower, into the stigma, which will then go down the tube. And of course, the, the flower will set seed or fruit. So I'm really hoping you're going to get really passionate about our local um, native pollinators. And I hope, as I said, I can debunk a few of those myths about things we call bad bugs. Um, beneficial insects are a really great sign that you have a healthy garden. Of course, if you're a passionate um, fruit and veggie grower like myself, you really want the pollinators to come and stay in your garden. So it's really important to think about creating safe gardening environment for local pollinators and not using pesticides or insecticides and just letting nature do its thing in your garden and observing nature. So if you provide enough habitat for pollinators, then the other beneficial insects will come, but also you're, you're benefiting the local bird life, the frogs, reptiles, and of course, other creatures. That connectivity throughout Hobson's Bay. So this session, as I said, we're going to talk about what is a native bee, how to identify a native bee, look at a native wasp, a hoverfly, a lacewing ladybird, praying mantis, look at food and habitat for bees, and of course, a little bit on biosecurity and how you can be an important citizen scientist over next month. It's so exciting uh, what's happening in November. But why should we care? Well, we should care because one in three bites of food requires pollination. And we all eat. I eat, you eat, and we all grow veggies, hopefully. We're all intrinsically linked to pollinators. Around the world, there are 325,000 flowering plants and crops that depend on pollination. And pollination, as we know, can either be by wind, 
can be by bees, can be by birds and some mammals, uh, can be by moths, they're excellent pollinators and can even be by bats. But the most um, generalist and specific pollinator is actually the bee. This year, a few months ago, the British Geographical Society named the bee as the most important species in the world. And it's really important we think about this. The bee really, you know, we don't pay the bee any money to pollinate our food, but maybe we should look after the bees a bit better because the bees are under a lot of stress. So if we think about it, it's not just bees that are pollinating our vegetables and fruits. There are some particular insects that have co-evolved with some um, of those fruits and one one thing I'm thinking about is cacao, where we get our chocolate from. That's actually pollinated by a really tiny fly. So one other example I want to tell you about is in the Northern Territory, we get a lot of our mangoes from now up in the Kimberley, is that there are not so many po native pollinators. Local farmers of mangoes in the area, they actually encourage blowflies to be the, the local um, pollinator for those crops because if you think about it, a blowfly has quite a hairy bum bit, quite a hairy abdomen, and a lot of the pollen sticks to those hairs as the blowfly looks for nectar, sweet nectar between the mango flowers. So what the farmers do up there, they get out um, big 44 gallon drums, steel drums, and they put rotting meat in it, rotting carcasses, which attracts the, the blowflies to come, lay their maggots and thus increase the blowfly population. There you go. You didn't think you're going to learn about blowflies tonight. But um, I was going to just say that um, Albert Einstein um, has said that if the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, then mankind would only have four years left. I don't quite believe this because there are some crops we obviously eat every day that don't require insect population, the main ones being the grasses such as wheat, rye, we've got um, rice, and of course things like corn, and interestingly some fruits such as banana and pineapple. But I don't know about you, I'm not sure I can have a banana smoothie every day, nor can I have um, popcorn, but um, the whole food web or, or food as we know it for the whole ecosystem would be drastically changed if there were no bees. So. What is this all about bees? Let's go back. What is a native bee? In Australia, we have an estimated 2,000 different species of native bees. Around the world, we have 20,000 different species of native bees. So we've got 10%, which is quite amazing. But if you think about all the different climatic zones, the different mountain ranges, the different environments where bees can survive in Australia, including the desert the and the plants that have evolved with those bees, we do have a vast array and, and healthy ecosystems for so many different species of bees. And if we think about it, we're really lucky because in Europe or Northern Hemisphere, a lot of places say in the UK, they only have about 234 species of native bees. We're doing pretty well here, but we've got to start looking after them. And there's a lot of pressure on our native pollinators, such as the impacts we've seen with the bushfires of last year and beginning of this year, of course, with drought and, of course, with um, flash um, flooding and sporadic rain that has occurred from climate change. And, of course, us in Hobson Bay and in Melbourne the increasing urbanisation, the increasing amount of roads and roof spaces and ovals and houses that are built with no gardens anymore uh, are all um, impacting the habitat and, of course, a reliable food source for our native bees. So where are these native bees coming from? Well, we have to go back about 120 million years ago. We have to go back before Tyrannosaurus rex, a long, long time ago. And what was back then was an ancestral wasp. And as we know, when we're having a barbecue, wasps love to eat meat. 
and they use the meat, meat being a protein. They take the meat back to their wasp nest and feed their young. They have meat for their babies, uh, for the eggs. So they use meat as their main source, but they also um, get the sugary hit of nectar, which is often why we see them around. Maybe you've got a sweet drink or we see some wasps on our flowers. So back 120 million years ago, there was some sort of evolutionary push for maybe a food source. So what happened was this very first bee evolved, as did the first ants, which is kind of interesting because ants and bees are the only species in the insect world with those really complex um, social hierarchy systems. Uh, and we had the first bees evolve as the same time back 120 million years, very simple flowers evolved. Before that, we just had the ferns and the ginkgos and so forth and the pines and conifers. So back then we, we had the very first flowers appearing and in the middle of the flower, of course, we've got nectar and pollen. And pollen is that protein source for the bees. So adult bees don't eat pollen. They use the pollen for their babies. So they'll take the pollen back to their nest. Adult bees just sip on nectar for their sugary energy hit. Okay, so nectar being the carbohydrate. So back then there was that, that push. So maybe some of those wasps, which became bees, you could kind of call they're having the protein from flowers as opposed from meat. So we know in Australia, as I said, we have almost 2,000 species of native bees. Uh, we also have a couple of introduced species. We have the um, Apis mellifera or honeybee, which came here in 1822. And we also had the bumblebee in Tasmania accidentally introduced in um, 1992 uh, in Hobart and now has become a feral bee population across all of Tasmania and is competing with food sources, even with the birds um, feeding on the eucalypt um, treetops uh, for flowers. And bumblebees, if you've ever seen one flying, they're really clumsy. Bumblebees are quite attracted to plants that they've co-evolved with, such as thistles and have taken the, the seeds um, from these weed plants throughout the Tasmanian National Parks has been attributed to the bumblebees. But let's talk about native bees here in Melbourne. All the native bees here in Melbourne are solitary. That means they live by themselves. It's the queen and the worker rolled into one, doing all the hard work. And unfortunately, they don't make honey, sorry to say. Uh, so they're pretty much all bees, like, all wasps around the world. In, a, in Around the world, there's about 7,000 different species of wasps. Actually, I think that's Australia. Let me, yeah, that's in Australia, 7,000 different species of wasps. Um, they are actually all solitary, almost all. In Australia, out of all those species, only 11 are, are social or they live in a hive structure. Uh, they've never lived in Melbourne. It's not because we wear so much black clothing, but it's because we just don't have enough uh, daylight hours and warmth in winter for these bees to forage. So our native pollinators, they can't fly as far as I earlier mentioned, and they actually are fuss pots. They like it when it's sunny. They don't like wind. They like it when it's really warm. They like it, the conditions to be perfect for them to go out and forage. They're just not as, as strong and robust as the imported honeybee for, for going out in the garden. So as I said, the majority are solitary. Um, they have the potential to sting, however, because most of our native bees, especially in Melbourne, are teeny tiny creatures. If you look at your pinky nail, most of our native bees are the size of your nail. They're really small. They're much, much smaller than the honeybee. And if they were going to sting you, they can't actually penetrate through the skin um, through the epidermis layer. Uh, they could potentially sting repeatedly compared to a honeybee who um, she lo loses her stinger uh, and thus dies. Um, however, if you were to be stung by a native bee, it would be similar to being bitten by an ant. So you would just um, wash this wound site, apply a little bit of ice. If you have an allergy to bees, the good news with our native bees is that you cannot have an anaphylactic reaction. 
And the other great thing about, well, not great thing, but the other thing to mention about our native bees is they're super shy creatures. And because they don't live in a hive, they haven't got that mentality like a honeybee to protect the queen. I've got to protect the queen. So let's move on. Uh, let's go on to thinking about how can we tell if I've got some native bees in my garden? Well, as I said, we've got to put our bee goggles on tonight. So Whilst I said earlier we've got some great pollinators such as birds and bats in the garden, it's really important to think that so many different insects such as moths and butterflies and flies can also act as pollinators, but they're accidental pollinators. That means they just get a little bit of pollen on their bodies as they sip nectar from the flowers, but they're not actively collecting pollen. The bee is the only species that collects pollen for its young. So, you know, interestingly in Australia, we've got a lot of our native wasps that co-evolve with a lot of our native orchids and they do an amazing job at pollination. But as I said, you know, those flowers have co-evolved with those native wasps to be their pollinator. So let's think of what are we looking at in our garden? And as I said, you know, our native bees come in all different shapes and sizes, but lots of them are small. So we've really got to look very closely. Um, I highly recommend if you haven't already got the app on your phone or computer uh, to download iNaturalist. It's fantastic. If you're unsure of what you're looking at, you take a few photos, you pop it on and some experts or some passionate people are going to tell you what it is. Um, hopefully you can put it into several categories if you can work out if it's a mammal or if it's an insect and, and try and define it down if it's a type of fly, for example, and then someone will come boom back at you with letting you know what it is because there's some amazing things happening in the garden. So there's a couple of different features. Look, this is just my little plastic models I usually pass around to everyone. There's a couple of different features. On the left, you'll see is a bee. On the right is a fly. So we're looking at four different features tonight. How do we define what is a bee or a wasp as opposed to a fly type insect in our garden? So the first thing to look at are the antenna. And pay attention. I'm going to test you after this picture. So I'm going to show you some confusing shots and I want you to work out if it's a bee or fly. So the first thing I want to tell you about this one is the antenna. Have a look at the bee antenna. The first thing you'll notice is they're really big and they actually come out like little bent coat hangers and we call them segmented antenna. You'll see some knobbly little bits on them, whereas a fly usually has very short, stubby antenna almost non-existent on many fly species. Now, the other thing to really look for with the, is how many wings. Well, to be honest, when you're looking at a flying creature, it's very hard to count the wings. But to let you know, the bee, as you can see, has four wings or two sets of wings, and the fly has one set. But when a fly rests on a flower, it's like a Boeing 47. It has its wings out in that triangle formation, whereas the bee is very ladylike and she folds her wings up behind her back. Uh, and, of course, it's a little bit hard to see with these models, but bees and wasps, they have a very slim waistline. So this part of the bee is called the thorax or the chest, and it has a very slim waistline between that and the abdomen, the bottom part of the of the bee, whereas a fly between the thorax and the abdomen, it's very, very um, broad, okay? So that is a really easy thing to compare between flies and bees. Um, the easiest thing I find is to look at their eyes. Bees and wasps and even ants, they all have these beautiful oval-shaped eyes on the sides of their heads, whereas Flies have these big bulging eyes at the front of the head. Okay, so of course, how do you tell the difference between a wasp and a bee? Well, often they're really hard because we have so many different native wasps and so many different native bees. Lots of them look really similar. So there are a couple of different clues, but the main clue is that the bee is collecting pollen 
whereas the wasp is just having a sweet sugary drink on your flower. Uh, sometimes you easily can see that a lot of wasps fly with their legs dangling, but, you know, that there's so many quirks that you really have to look at the specimen very, very close up. So I'm just going to move to the next shot. And what do you think this creature is? Do you think it's a bee or a wasp with those four tips that I've just told you? I'll give you a second. And so all my shots are very close up. I hope that's okay. But it's actually a native bee. This is called a leaf cutter bee. And you'll notice straight away she's got segmented antenna and big eyes. Again, it's pretty hard to see, but she does have those two sets of wings, four wings in total, and a slim waist. Okay, so it's a leaf cutter or a mega chili bee. And what about this little character? What do you think this one is? As I should have said at the start to a lot of our native bees and our native wasps and our flies come in all different shapes, colours and sizes. I'll give you a moment. There's a lot of um, insects are very attuned to trying not being eaten by predators. So they've, they've evolved with lots of camouflage or biomimicry stuff happening. So this is actually called a seraphid fly or a wasp mimic fly. So the you can tell it's a fly um, mainly by the size of its big bulging eyes at the front of the head. It actually has fake antenna. Um, and again, it's really hard to see, but this is actually one wing. Um, it's cheating. It's got quite a slim waist and the colours look very similar to a wasp or a bee, but it's a fly. And it does a lot of damage to a lot of the um, native bees up north that do produce honey, the sugar bag bees or the tetragonula cabanaria. The sounds like a pasta dish, but it's not. These bees that have honey, this particular fly goes into the hive and lays its maggots into the little um, brood cells of the native bees. Does a lot of damage. Uh, what about this creature? What do you think this one is? The suspense, I know. This is actually a fly, and some of you might be noticing this particular fly in your garden. It's called a hoverfly. There's several different species of hoverflies. And again, telltale sign is those big eyes. And the really interesting thing about hoverflies is it looks like oh, their eyes are often reddish in colour, but it looks like someone has got the back of a teaspoon and pressed down on top of the eyes. So they're indentated eyes on the top. And of course, a hoverfly is trying to pretend to look like a wasp so it's not tasty. And you'll notice the way they fly, they really hover around. So these are one of the good insects you want in your garden. It is not a wasp. And of course, it is an amazing, ferocious eater of aphid. You really want to be encouraging this guy um, into your garden as a, also an important pollinator. After bees, this is considered one of the best pollinators because it's got those little bristles on its, on its thorax and goes so much from flower to flower. So the next picture um, for you to guess is this particular creature. Again, you know, different coloured eyes. I'll give you a moment. This is actually a resin bee. This is another mega chili bee, so a native bee. And you'll notice this one's called, um, has got red eyes. It's all common name as the brow headed resin bee, um, mega chili afrions. And it's actually on some hardened bergia. So if you know the size of hardened bergia flowers, they're really small. That gives you an idea how big this bee is. So, I'm going to keep going with some really interesting bees and their nesting behaviours. So in Melbourne, what's been recorded is about 105 different species of native bees from about the docklands to about 20 kilometres out, okay? So that's quite a big variety of native bees. And, um, you know, I think especially in Hobson's Bay, you'll definitely have some species that are really comfortable um, sitting in your area. So this is one of those mega chili bees. Usually mega chili bees um, have this orange um, rear end and in the native bee world, we like to call them red bums. This is a really common bee in your garden and it's quite a large bee. It's a similar size to a honeybee. 
and you'll notice she's been very ladylike and folding her wings behind her. She likes to nest in wood. So often if you see some old eucalypt limbs that have a lot of wood borer holes or native trees that have, have a limb that's fallen onto the ground, if you have a look on the sunny side that's facing north, you might see lots of little holes in it that are filled with this um, resin, which is why the common name is called a resin bee. So these bees collect resin from the uh, eucalypts or the acacia trees, and they take it back to their nest and they actually um, plug up their nesting hole once they've laid all their eggs uh, with this resin. And that stops any predators getting in and, of course, any of the bad weather. And um, what happens then the beginning of the next bee season is that the baby bees emerge. They're able to chew out with their mandibles, their little sort of teeth parts, and, and, and fly around your garden. And like most native bees, they'll actually come back to the same nesting spot. So if you're really keen, I've given you lots of instructions in the buzz and dig handout on how to build some materials for a bee hotel. Um, ideally, if you want to do lots of drilled pieces of wood, these bees love hardwood. So this is actually a piece of red gum and you want to drill really deep. You want to drill about 12 centimetres deep. So you need an auger drill bit. And you need a bit of grunt because you're going through hardwood, so you'll need a, a few battery packs on hand. And uh, what happens when these bees um, collect pollen and nectar from the flowers? They go back to this little hole. They don't make any honey. They make like a little food parcel for their, for their egg. They lay an egg and then they make a little bedroom door inside. And they'll end up laying maybe 10 to 12 eggs in that 12 centimetre hole and plug it up, as you can see, which looks like toffee when it's fresh or, or bits of sawdust or maybe a bit of chewed up leaf with resin, and then it becomes really hard. Now, the reason we have to drill um, holes if we're creating bee hotels so deep is because native bees, like other interesting things insects do, is they'll always lay female bees first. So if the hole was, um, let's say, 12 centimetres in depth, the female bee will lay 10 eggs that will be females, followed off by two male bee eggs, and then she'll plug up that hole. And she'll do this out throughout the bee season. So the bee season has started just now. In September, all those young bees are starting to emerge out of their nest looking for food in your garden and come back to the same spot to nest. So the bees obviously uh, are tuned with spring and flowers, best time to come out foraging. So all through spring and summer and, of course, autumn, until the weather starts getting really cool, that's when the adult bees are going out there doing all their pollinating. Then the adult bees die off and, and the bees over time develop over winter from a little egg into a larvae and then coming spring, they become a young bee waiting to come out. They eat the food reserve mums left for them and then they'll come out into your garden. So a really easy thing to do is have a really deep hole. Now, you'll notice a lot of bee hotels um, out there you can buy really cheaply um, from the big bee place or somewhere, you know, hardware-y. Uh, look, they're okay, but they're not really geared for our local bees. So one of the problems is a lot of those um, store-bought bee hotels um, are not deep enough, which means it's a bit of an issue because a female bee will come along and go, oh, that looks like a nice place to nest in your garden, and she'll still lay some eggs, but she might end up just laying three or four female eggs followed off by two male eggs because that's how she lays her eggs. She'll always have two males at the end. They're the closest to the door. They're the closest to the predators. And if we think about it, who do you think's doing all the hard work in your garden? Who's going out there getting the pollen and nectar from the flowers and taking it back to the nest and maybe chewing with their little mandibles a nice hole and laying an egg and making a bedroom door and going out again? Which bee do you think is doing that? Is it the male bee or the female bee? That's right. It's the female bee. So we want to ensure, because the female bees are doing all the pollination, that we have a 
good, healthy number of females in the population the following. We don't want to skew the gender ratio and cause problems in our garden. And that can happen if we have a lot of store-bought bee hotels. Bee hotels are really easy to make with a lot of things probably already existing in your garden. So this is another example of a bee hotel. So if you've got any bits of wood you can just drill, have a go. Pop it in a box and pop it somewhere really sunny. So ideally facing north, about eye height is, is really fantastic. So everyone in the family can see all your native bees coming in and out. And of course, near your veggies or fruit trees, perfect spot. Um, this is a really common bee that we will see in our gardens. This is actually called a reed bee, and this bee is really small. It's just a little bit bigger than a, an ant. It looks very ant-like, and you'll notice again it's got those big antenna, eyes on the side of their head, and a reed bee actually has a sort of reddish abdomen. So they're kind of an easy bee to spot. So reed bees are looking for a nest in, in pithy canes such as raspberry or passion fruit or grape or, or even bamboo. So again, let these materials dry out. You can even pop them in a can. Um, I've got one here. I don't know how big I am on the screen, but uh, you've got a can there. I can show you later if you didn't get to see. Uh, pop them somewhere, as I said, about eye height. And you can encourage a lot of these bees into your garden too. Well, there, there's the can. Sorry, I forgot about it. So there's a can um, that I've just got. And this is a can just from some coconut milk. So if you're having a curry tonight or some pasta, save the can. They're amazing bee hotels. And just pop your dried materials in it. You'll notice in the middle they've even got some really small stems. Um, this is probably from my lemon verbena or holly um, budlia or something. And these reed bees love it, okay? So really easy to make bee hotels yourself, make fantastic presents for people. And I've just covered my can with a little bit of um, melaleuca or paper bark to make it look pretty. So another type of nesting behaviour is actually of the 70% of all species of native bees in Australia is actually ground nesting. They, they burrow in, in the soil and, and lay their eggs the same way as I mentioned uh, and just leave the entrance open. So one of our most popular or well-known ground dwellers is the blue banded bee. This is a blue banded bee. And the first thing you'll notice if you have blue banded bees in your garden is she makes a buzzing sound before you probably see her. She goes, zzz, zzz, zzz. And she actually flies the same as a hoverfly. She zips around everywhere. And you'll notice here she's um, got her head deep in a salvia. And what she does once she's sipped all the nectar, she does this wonderful thing called buzz pollination. Now, buzz pollination is required by 8% of flowering plants around the world. And what she does, she holds on to the anthers of the plant with her little teeth, her mandibles, and she shakes, she vibrates at 350 times a second. And that particular flower then is able to expel the pollen. It vibrates out of the flower. And that's the only um, type of bee um, is a ground-dwelling bee that, that does this buzz so what's really interesting is that 8% of these flowering plants have, that require buzz pollination have actually evolved with buzz pollinators. And if we think about it, a lot of plants um, in our veggie patch have come from the new world and they've evolved with their own native pollinators. And a lot of native pollinators that buzz pollinate, say, in, the, um, in other countries are actually bumblebees. So they buzz pollinate. So we don't naturally have bumblebees in Australia. As I said, they're accidentally introduced in Tassie, but they're causing trouble. Uh, but we have these beautiful bees like blue banded bees uh, that buzz pollinate. So I just want to mention this little plant. This is a local endemic species of my area, the grasslands in, in northern Melbourne. This is a Dianella. Uh, this is called a common name, Dianella, um, the matted flax lily, 
or the botanical name is the Dianella amina. So the Dianella amina is a really interesting plant because it has co-evolved with a buzz pollinator. And you'll notice with this particular flower, like the anthers, the pollen's actually up the, the tube of the flower. So when the blue bender bee comes on, she can shake the, the pollen out of this flower. Now, I want to quickly tell you a story about this flower because it's really interesting. I hope you can buy it in your local nurseries. It has basically come back from the brink of extinction. In 2016, a local friends group, the Friends of the Merry Creek, found some of these Dianellas in, in a poor state along the creek. And they set up a crowdfunding campaign and they raised lots and lots of money from the public and the, the then DPI uh, was able to match it. They were able to collect all the rootstock and rhizomes and seeds of this Dianella, take it back to the Victorian Indigenous Nursery Co-op in Fairfield and create really robust tube stock from 42 parent plants. And then with the money they raised for this project, they were able to replant this Dianella along the Merry Creek at 350 metre intervals. And they planted it with a lot of other local flowering plant species. And the reason they planted it 350 metres is because the blue banded bee, that's as far as she can fly from her nest. So as I said at the start, compared to the honeybee, our native pollinators, they just can't fly very far. So they're really looking for food sources in the area. And now because lots of um, awareness has happened about this style, Nala Amina, especially with a lot of local governments, uh, and you can actually now buy it in a lot of the local nurseries, which have a good um, Indigenous plant section, Dianella Amina. A-M-O-E-N-A, -E in case anyone's writing it down. Uh, this plant is now considered rare status, which is amazing. I have about five of these planted in my garden. Wouldn't it be great if everyone on my neighbourhood block had this plant in the area? So again, as I said, the, the most important species to pollinate this plant is the bl blue banded bee, a buzz pollinator. But of course, we grow lots of yummy vegetables in our garden and, and part of those vegetables that require buzz pollination are things in our Solanum family. So think about those juicy tomatoes, those capsicums, those eggplants and those chilies and blueberries all require buzz pollination. So it's really important to try and encourage blue band bees in your garden or any bee that lives in the ground. So lots of smaller bees also do this buzz pollination. Um, so, you know, one of the best things you can do, now this is something we all do in Melbourne and we try and do it very well, and that is put mulch everywhere. So here's some example from my garden. I've got a lot of pine bark on the paths and I've got a lot of pea straw or sugarcane mulch throughout the veggie beds. But these bees are so small, it's very hard for them to create a burrow through all this big organic debris. They can't, they're not attracted to this. The natural nesting sites for these bees is actually along the creeks or clay um, and sandy loamy embankments um, that's how they nest because when they make a tunnel, they make one long tunnel and then they make side chambers to lay all their eggs. So the best thing you could do to create habitat for blue banded and nesting bees is to actually have a sunny area clear of mulch. Now you can might be able to have a lot of clay, sandy clay in your area. So if you're able to keep a sunny spot, maybe beside the house where kids aren't playing and dogs and bikes aren't going over, you might see lots of tiny little holes in that area. They look a little bit like an ant hole um, and it means blue banded bees are there. And it's really interesting because blue banded bees, despite being solitary, they actually like to nest with like-minded neighbours. And the research has shown that blue banded bees actually uh, when they nest, sorry, I'll just pop that on. Uh, when they nest, they actually have like sisterhood going on. Often one female bee will guard the nest and um, the others will go out and then they'll come back and, and take their own side chambers. 
And I forgot to mention at the start, I said female bees do all the hard work with pollinating our garden. You're probably wondering what the male bees are doing. Well, they are actually um, just hanging. <laughs> male bees, <laughs> they don't even bother collecting pollen. They just sip on nectar and they wait for the females to emerge from their nests uh, to mate with, so to make babies. So you'll notice here these are a lot of blue banded bee boys hanging out together at night. They are all holding on for dear life with their mandibles on some some grasses or anything that's sort of stringy and climbing, maybe like jasmine or some clematis, things like that these bees are really attracted to. So if you do have native blue banded bees in your area, have a look around, um, especially at dusk, to see if you see maybe 30 or 40 um, male blue banded bees coming in to roost for the night. Um, it'd be quite a sight to see. They all jostle for a good spot on the stem. And, of course, they are susceptible to microbats and um, tawny frogmouths and other creatures out there that are looking for a nocturnal snack. Uh, of course, as I just mentioned before, have a go at making a bee hotel. Look around your garden for nice pithy stems to attract the reed bees. Use bits of old wood. Let it dry out before you drill the holes. Or have a go making some clay um, homes like we saw earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. You can make a, a um, mud brick home for blue banded bees just using some PVC piping and lots of clay. Uh, look, it, it can take a couple of years. This particular spot is in a, in a park reserve in Faulkner and has been very successful. Excuse me. because the blue banded bees are already in the area and just moving ahead <clears throat> if you're building a bee hotel have a go as i said building your own use whatever types of wood you like as long as it's not painted with like lead paints or it's composite particle board have a go at anything you'll notice here i put in a few fillers that's because um, a lot of the boxes get really heavy <clears throat> And if you mount them up um, at eye height, you don't want them falling on someone's head. So a lot of my bee hotels, I even put on a table outside as long as it's facing north because our native bees are cold-blooded creatures. They want to warm up for their first foraging trip in the morning and, and get lots of sun. So don't put them under a fruit tree. Don't put them in the shade. Face as much sun as possible. So north to northeast is ideal. And... Ideally, you want to place your bee hotel at a slight slope from the back. So imagine that the back of the box, uh, you just want to tilt slightly upwards so that the materials like in this picture look like they're on an angle and the bees can crawl upwards into the canes. Uh, and this is because the mama bees are really looking for a place where the uh Baby bees will be protected from any moisture. Like most insects, they nest on an incline. So even if I had this placed on a table, I just put a bamboo cane right at the back of the box to give it that 10 degree tilt. And I wanted to show you this picture because um, I've seen um, a picture of this particular bee. This is a domino spotted cuckoo bee. And I have seen a photo taken with the grass reserve under the Westgate Bridge, that some of you are probably familiar with, of this particular bee. So this cuckoo bee and her cousin, the neon cuckoo bee, are spectacular bees, uh, but they're also the cloak and dagger bees in the bee world, and they actually will lay their eggs inside a host bee nest, namely the blue banded bee, and their eggs will um, hatch first, eat the food reserves of the blue banded bee, and then they'll pupate, go into a little cocoon, and they'll emerge um, later on in the season when the weather warms up. Meanwhile, the, the baby blue banded bees, uh, they hatch and the, there's no food reserves for them. Exciting stuff, insects. So one of the last ones I want to show you, of course, is the vast array of our native bees. This one looks very similar to a honeybee. She's called a leafcutter bee, and she actually collects the pollen 
on the underside of her abdomen. So she's full of pollen in this shot. And you'll notice these flowers are actually look quite large. They're actually basil flowers. So um, native bees, like other bees, um, actually see flowers in different colours from what we do. So the example I've got here on the left is a jonquil, the yellow flower is how we see it. Native bees see in UV, they see in ultraviolet, which means they see um, a lot of the colours we see, but in more on the purples and blues on the spectrum and less so on the red colours. So whilst they see a yellow, we see a yellow flower, they see the yellow flower in purple. And you'll notice in the middle of the flowers, these green colours. The flower has evolved to be pollinated by an insect and it has created what we call poll pollinator trackers or UV trackers or looks almost like a pretty pattern to excite the bee to come and visit. And what researchers have recently found is that over time, some flowers are able to change their trackers to let the bees know they've been pollinated and are about to set seed or fruit. So it's a really interesting relationship between our favourite flowers, where they love the purples and blues, followed off by yellows, whites and pinks. That's the top five colours. But some other flowers um, have evolved with lots of UV trackers. But in general, blues and purples are their preferred flowers. And what I have a lot in my garden, especially at this time of the year, just before the native bees are coming out, is lots and lots of flowers near my veggies. So you can see here I've got calendula. So lots of daisy flowers are fantastic. Borage is another fantastic flower. The blue one there, we can eat the flowers. And they have nectar, which is great for the honeybees as well, and other insects such as butterflies and hoverflies, because each flower fills up with nectar every three minutes. Now we're going to move over to some other beneficial insects. So what on earth are these things? Have you seen these in your garden or even these? Do you think they're a good bug or a bad bug? They look like little mini crocodiles, I think, but they are actually the larvae of ladybirds. And um, ladybirds are fantastic, but their larvae actually do all the hard work. So their larvae actually are amazing because they can eat so many aphid. I think in two weeks of their life, they can eat 400 aphid. Uh, so they've got ferocious aphid appetite. So often, if we have an aphid infestation at the beginning of spring, if we leave plants be, if we're not spraying them, if we're not spraying the roses, then the, aph the um, aphid um, have that unfortunate uh, neighbour of some ladybird eggs hatching into these guys. So you'll notice, uh, you know, that's something that maybe is not what we're expecting is a ladybird. So another creature I want to mention quickly is what else is happening in your bee hotel is often you'll get a lot of solitary wasps also nesting. So if you see some of the holes, um, some of these have been plugged with mud that is because it's been plugged by something called a mud wasp. So I'll just show you on the next shot what it looks like. And they're fine. They're not going to harm the native bees. But what they are doing, this is the mud wasp from my garden, is they're actually collecting lots of little caterpillars and aphids and other insects we normally perceive as a, a pest and taking it back to their nesting hole and, and laying their egg um, in it and and that's um, over time that egg will um, evolve uh, become a, a baby wasp which will eat that insect uh, as, as its food source so they're really great and should be encouraged in our garden to have lots of native wasps they won't harm us um, 
you know, they're not like the European wasp, which we need to get on top of to keep their populations low because they are an introduced species. But our native wasps, yeah, they're, they're a really integral part of a healthy ecosystem. And of course, important as part of local biodiversity. Now, another wasp you might have seen in your garden and you're not sure what is, these are quite large. Uh, they're about, I think, three centimetres long, is the blue flower wasp. So wasps, um, like adult bees, they just sip nectar from the flowers for their energy source. So these are really interesting wasps because this is a male that you see. Any of these creatures you see flying here a male. They often fly low to the ground and they have these beautiful shiny wings. The female lives underground and they have a beautiful courting ritual where the male will pick the female up from the ground, take her to a flower so she can sip nectar and they will mate and then he drops her back down to the ground and she will find one of those beetle larvae and um, will lay her eggs inside the beetle larvae and again it, it's an important food source for that particular um the the babies of that particular wasp so it's really interesting because the female only gets to sip nectar once from a flower um, but the boys out there looking for females and getting to sip lots of nectar from flowers so the um other unsung hero of course i mentioned earlier is the hoverfly. And like the ladybird, the hoverfly has um, pretending to be a bee because she's this particular hoverfly has got the wings folded on some brassica flowers, but again is an essential pollinator and a ferocious appetite of those aphids. So we've really got to start looking and seeing these unsung heroes as integral and reflective of good, healthy biodiversity in our backyard. So we don't need to use our sprays and we need to have those conversation with our neighbours not to use the sprays. This is my little picture of the ladybird. Sorry, my pictures are not in the right order, I just realised. Um, and of course, you know, we want to encourage ladybirds, but there's a reason why we want to encourage them because their larvae forms are the eaters of a lot of smaller sap sucking pests. Um, oh, there we go. We've got doubled up on them. There we are. So we're back to those baby ladybirds. I'll just keep going. Here's another really interesting creature you want to be encouraging your gardens. Uh, it's called a lace wing. And one of the things, it took me many years to actually realise what these are. On the underside of some plant leaves, you'll notice these tiny hairs. And on each hair is actually a lace wing egg. And these are really great predators in the garden. So this is the adult lace wing. And it's called a lace wing, obviously, because its wings are see-through. And it is, is an amazing creature to have in your garden because it's eating a lot of those soft um, sap sucking pests such as aphids, but also thrip and scale and white fly and some mites. So this is a really interesting creature also to have in your garden. And I've given you a link. If you're very keen on, on having um, an addition of beneficial insects, you can actually order these eggs from a reputable beneficial insect breeder. So I've given you a link. You can get ladybird eggs, you can get lacewing eggs, and I think you can get uh, something else. So it's, it's escaped me for the moment, but here's obviously the, the big praying um, mantis. Oh, sorry, the, the lacewing can eat 60 aphid an hour. Pretty good, hey? So uh, the prey mantis is a fantastic creature to have. And what I noticed, because my garden's now ready for native bees, I'm getting a lot more prey mantis. So the population's increasing of these predatory insects. And these are great insects because they'll eat anything. They'll eat moths, they'll eat spiders, they'll eat flies, they will eat bees. They'll eat lots and lots of creatures. So again, you, you're providing the right environment in your garden. Uh, for some predatory creatures. And in its term, as part of the food web, 
other creatures eating these. So I've got now in my garden lots of marble geckos and they quite like eating praying mantises. And, of course, um, you know, the birds and if you have fortunate, some small reptiles will also like eating them and, you know, things like some of the microbats. So it's all in turn to not just accommodate one type of insect but to have the right environs and and good gardening um, techniques to encourage lots of beneficial insects into your garden. So one of the easiest things to do is have lots and lots of flowers, not only for food but also for habitat. And I'm sorry this picture is a little bit distorted, but it's really just to show you how much you can pack in a small space. And I really like having lots of flowers, not only for me, but knowing that I'm providing a valuable food source. So if you've got an edible garden, let all your herbs and, and some of your um, vegetables go to seed. It's a win-win for us. We get to collect the seed. As you'll see in the front, there's lots of parsley, but the insects get to have some food. And for some insects, it's also important habitat to hide or nesting. So we've got to think of insects, not only the adult form, but also their larvae or their or their baby form, what sort of food that they're interested in. And of course, most insects, our native pollinators, will always choose native local plants. So this is a Wallenbergia communist. So if you have a little space to plant some local endemic species, go and chat to your great nursery people and go and buy these. These are fantastic plants that everyone should have in the garden because we want to make sure that not only we're having healthy insect populations, but also ensuring that we are able to support, support local plant species that have been adapted to our harsh environment in Melbourne. And of course, as I said, not only letting a lot of your herbs go to seed, we get a lot of those flower heads. So native in, um, bees, like all pollinators, they want the best bang for their buck. So they want to make sure they can not expend too much energy and get as much food resources as they can in a small area. So anything that is an umble shaped flower head, here, for example, is fennel. Uh, think of the parsley shaped I showed you earlier. Think of your dill. Think of your carrot flowers. If you've ever seen carrots growing, anything that's got that umbrella shaped head is perfect for insects to get pollen and nectar from. Of course, here is some yarrow having a variety of plants. This little bee is at, on here is actually called a masked bee or halius bee. And of course, she can collect so much in a small space so we all have small gardens now unfortunately these are really great plants to have if they're exotics because they flower for a long time outs do salvias and of course we don't want to just be encouraging local bees we want to make sure we get the pollinators also like our butterflies this is the painted lady on the left uh, but we also want to make sure what's actually happening in our garden. And I really want to talk about this a lot because we have the responsibility of our patch of earth to be looking after it. And a lot of you know with the honeybee that the honeybee populations around the world have been decimated by the varroa mite. Now, in Australia, we have an amazing biosecurity team that so far have been able to keep varroa mite out of Australia. But we do have it very close to us. In New Zealand, they've had varroa mite since the 1990s. So it is probably inevitable that varroa mite will show up on our doorstep. And even in Melbourne last year, we had a uh, cargo shipping container from Texas full of electrical cable with a feral honeybee hive like inside the container and those bees had varroa mites so luckily we've got some amazing apiarists in melbourne who are part of our biosecurity team that were able to make sure that those particular um, bees 
were successfully eradicated. You might have noticed down at the docklands, there are lots of beehives if you've ever gone past on a boat, and that's to encourage any native bees, uh, any um, feral bee populations to go straight into those hives so they can be eradicated is so integral for our crop pollination and um, for our honeybee populations and our apiarist industry to keep varroa mite out of Australia. Now, luckily, with all our native bees, they can't get varroa mite because, as I said, most of them are solitary bees. The only bees that can be affected by a honeybee disease are the blue-banded bees can end up with um, chalk brood, but that's all that I know of. However, since I've been looking in my garden and observing what's happening, I've been noticing a lot of different insects and I wanted to show you this video of the bee, which I thought, oh, this is a really cool native bee, doing something that is unusual in behaviour. And this bee is actually taking off the hairs of the leaves of this plant. And you'll notice while this bee is doing that, it's like, oh, this is really interesting. This is not what our native bees do. And I've realised that this is actually an accidentally introduced African carder bee. So this bee was first spotted in Brisbane in 2000. And it's taken um, 15 years to get down to Melbourne. And last year was the first time I noticed it in my garden. Now, whilst we don't know too much about this bee, we know it's not affecting our native bee populations. What we're aware of, though, with biosecurity is how fast a, an introduced species can spread. And this is really important because we're able to sort of track how far this bee is able to travel. And often it is travelling on a lot of our, um, our trucks going into state and, and that's how it's from human actions that a lot of these um, introduced species are able to move. So there is a biosecurity or citizen scientist project. If you do spot an African carter bee, you're able to pop it into um, a site and they'll be able to record it. And if you can let them know what particular plant it is carding, it's taking all those hairs off for its nest. It ends up like a big cotton wool nest and lays its eggs in that. Again, you know, it's just being aware of what's happening in your garden. So let's move further ado. This is the exciting thing that's happening next month. Next month is um, Australian Pollinator Week in November. So not next month, in November. On the uh, 8th to the 15th of November, it goes for a week, where you can be a citizen scientist. You can watch some flowers in your garden for 10 minutes and record all the pollinators that land on those flowers. So I've given you a link. Um, you can see me filling out the, the pollinator tally sheet. It's a great thing to do with kids. And you'll notice next shot, I've got another video just showing one of my bee hotels. And I just show you, this is what you'll see common in summer, summer is a bit of activity going in and out all day long um, with native bees. So I hope that that's inspired you a little bit uh, to look a bit closer with some beneficial insect goggles on and see what's really happening amongst your flowers and veggies in the garden and to encourage more bees, the best thing we can do, obviously, is to plant more flowers. And of course, you know, as back to that biosecurity, the reason why I'm on about let's be um, responsible for our, our gardens and, and looking at what insects are in our gardens is because another um, species that's causing a lot of problems now in Victoria is the Queensland fruit fly. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it because I don't had I have not seen it yet in my garden, but I know other local gardeners have. But it's something you ought to discuss with your council, Hobson Bay Council, City Council, to see what measures you can do to prevent um, fruit, the Queensland fruit fly in your garden. Uh, obviously, for our commercial crops, this is a really serious uh, thing that we've tried to keep out for many decades, but I'm with trucks and, and with people's movements interstate. So this is my garden in summer. As you notice, it's full of flowers. I have a lot of veggie beds to the left and right of this. 
I have a lot of activity with insects, humming, and I love being in my garden. I love just hanging out in our garden. And I think that's what we sometimes forget, but definitely during the six, last six months for myself, I've really enjoyed having a space where I can sit with a cuppa, talk to members of my family, or just be, read a book, pat a cat, whatever. It, it gardens are so important for us to have. And your garden might be just on your balcony with lots of pot plants. Make sure you've got some flowering plants. Our bees, when they go out foraging, they go for three to five foraging trips a day. And they're looking for three different types of flowers. They don't see this as a smorgasbord. They're very specific on each trip when they go out. So they're only looking for three different flower types max on each trip. Uh, ideally, it'd be lovely to have the same type of flowers, you know, for acres throughout the neighbourhood, but we don't. And, you know, that's a great thing if you're local beekeeper, you will see the different shades of pollen when you take out a comb of honey uh, from the season if your hive hasn't been moved around. So this is me and my garden. Of course, the main thing I love supporting local biodiversity has been so I can enjoy the garden, but also that I get a great array of fruit and vegetables from my garden. And knowing that they have been pollinated by a lot of native pollinators makes me so excited. So I'm going to just start here because I know there's going to be lots and lots of questions in our last few minutes. Please, I'm Buzz and Dig. I'm Katrina Forstner. If you're interested and you've got any questions or photos of insects, send them my way or download the app iNaturalist. Follow me on Facebook or Instagram. Send me beautiful pictures of your garden. I would love, love to see them. So how do I, am I out? No, I'm not out. Where's me? Where am I back to stop sharing? So just, just before, before the, the, sorry, sorry just left, left of the three little dots. Can everyone see me? Yep, cool. Thanks. Excellent. <laughs> yep, we've got you back, Katrina. Thank you. So all the questions that were asked in the chat have all been answered, but just like in that. case those people who asked them in the chat didn't see the question, we might just quickly go back over them. Um, so Diane asked about how many native types of bees we have in Victoria. Yeah, so in Victoria, I'm not really sure of the numbers, but in Melbourne, I know <clears throat> what's been recorded by Melbourne Museum is 105 species. And despite us living in an urban area, they've actually found there are more um, species of native bees as opposed to a lot of farming areas. Because if you think about it, a lot of our farming is monoculture farming. So the bees are unable to have a reliable food source throughout that um, season unless there's pockets of bush um, nearby. So if you have hectares and hectares of canola, it's very hard for native bees to have an adequate food source because once those flowers have finished flowering, there's nothing for the native bees. So often with those sort of areas, and especially now what's happening is a lot of apiaries have to move their honeybees into those crops at just so they're um, flowering and being pollinated for a couple of weeks and then the the apiaries move those beehives out again i will try and find that out though i'm intrigued um alana did you want to unmute yourself to ask your question oh yes so um hello thank you for your um session it was very helpful um um i have gore wasps so, and um, I've been using a yellow sticky tape this year and um, trying to talk to my neighbours to cut the girl what's out of her lemon tree, but it was a rental next door, so she doesn't really care. So that's why I want to know, um, apart from using the sticky tapes, whether is there anything else I can help to save my poor little lime tree? <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah, sure. So lime tree, they love lime trees because limes are a little bit softer and sappier um, out of all the citrus. And 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 gall wasps are um, native pests for our native limes. So that's where they've come from. Uh, look, there's a couple of different um, theories what to do. So a lot of people believe you should prune all the galls that you see before June. So before the next population of insects emerge from those galls and dispose of it in your landfill bin, um, bag it up. 
Uh, others, I've read that you can paint the galls with like a lime-based paint solution or what you're doing yourself is using those sticky um, traps. The only issue with a lot of those sticky traps I have, and it depends on um, how big your sticky traps are, is if they're quite uh, wide tapes, a lot of our native birds, the really small birds such as um, our fairy wrens or our scrub wrens um, can actually get their wings stuck on the tape. And, and I've seen some pretty icky pictures of it. But I think because you're in an urbanised area, you probably haven't got that many um, birds that are used to understory plants. Uh, but just bear in mind how you're hanging them and what sort of other insects are sticking to them. But, look, there's yeah. a few different approaches. So one of them you can look up is yeah, uh, Save Our Citrus campaign, which okay. is run by someone called Kay. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for that, Alana. And Diane, she's put in the chat, um, peeling off with a veggie peeler. And that's one that I've seen um, used a little bit as well. I guess, you know, talking about the ecosystem, are there any predators of the gall wasp that we could be trying to attract into our garden to prey upon the gall wasp? Uh, well, look, I think a lot of those predatory um, insects I mentioned, I know gall wasps are very small. So they're actually really hard for us to see see them like sort of out and about um, I don't know too much about them when they do emerge apart from myself I usually prune hard but I have seen recently that peeling of the gall is meant to help but I sort of prune hard um, my citrus and again trying to have those conversations with your neighbours even if it's a rental go across with your secateurs get them to make you a cup of tea when when the restrictions lift and, and just prune their tree like why not uh, give it a hard prune as well. <laughs> Offer to do it yourself is probably yeah. a good way to get it to happen. Um, Liz, would you like to unmute yourself to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Um, I've heard that it's good to provide water for bees, um, but there is a danger of a bee drowning if you don't set it up correctly. So it'd be great to learn um, how to best do that. And um, I guess I wanted to know too if all pollinators, pollinators need water or is it just bees? Sorry, I've lost sound. Uh, Katrina, can you hear me? Yep, can you hear me? Yes. So what was the end of the question? Sorry, all pollinators need water, was that it? Yes, so um, but I know that I've heard the bees need water, but do all pollinators need water? And, and what's the safest way to provide um, water for our bees? Okay, so interestingly, native bees actually don't drink water even when they collect nectar they often um, like blow bubbles like chewing gum and concentrate the nectar so they're sort of releasing a lot of the water uh, because they get enough liquid from nectar so our native bees actually don't need water sources but I, I agree with you I think you need to put water out especially for the honeybees so ideally if you've got a saucer um, and you put some um, pebbles and definitely some sticks across it so a little bit submerged and a little bit so they can crawl out. Uh, it's really great for honeybees because honeybees use water to regulate the, their um, temperatures in their hives in summer and of course a lot of other insects do enjoy having a drink so as long as you've got an area um, yeah that's a little bit in partial shade is really important not and just regularly um, topping up the water source uh, you'll definitely get some other creatures so another great thing you do, can do for pollinators especially butterflies is set up a mud bath because butterflies will uh, often go to puddles because they like to actually uh, drink minerals so that's really important for butterflies so if you're able to get a bit of a mud pie happening in the backyard uh, make sure again you've got some sticks sort of going in and out of the the saucer or pot uh, but maybe you might get some uh, butterflies having a sip of moisture from that. Mm, that Fabulous thank like you. <laughs> uh, thank you for that question Liz. Um, Anna would you like to unmute to ask your question? Hello I'm the mum of the bear but I've got <laughs> Super balls. Uh, do you want to hang on? 
We can hear you, Anna. Hang on, Anna, I'll mute you from my end if I can find you. Hang on, Anna. Oh, it won't let me unmute you. Sorry, we've got I... a couple of screens going on. That's why there was the issue. Um, what if, we've got an edible garden, but what would be the top three flowers that you would recommend for your pollinators? Okay, so thanks for the question, Anna, because um, I've actually given you a handout which lists a lot of the flowers I would recommend. So ideally to have a mix of flowers for local pollinators. So, um, you know, lots of pollinators come in different shapes and sizes and are also attracted to different flowers. So ideally having a mix of some native flowers somewhere in your garden is fantastic. Uh, of, of course, letting all your herbs go to flower. Uh, I really find blue banded bees love my basil flowers. And having a lot of flowers that flower for a long time and provide either a lot of <clears throat> pollen or nectar or both. And some flowers have a, a really high ratio of pollen, uh, such as poppies. And of course, uh, that artichoke I showed earlier. Uh, so my my flowers will work really well in my garden are flowers I can get for free. So I go around my neighbourhood with my pair of secateurs in my bag and I, and I often find stuff over the fence. Now, if I can find the person to have a bit of a chat, but I think if it's hanging out, it's anyone's. Great plants that are so easy to propagate and are fantastic for our pollinators are salvias. So they're, they're called Mexican sages. So they're part of the mint family. So they are really great because they're fantastic in Melbourne. They're very, um, once they're established, they're very drought hardy and they have beautiful flowers and you can get them in all different colours. Uh, I Again, anything in purples and blues. So if you're looking at natives, you can look at things like, um, well, uh, Wistringia, um the the bluebells i showed you the tufted bluebells the wallenbergia hardenbergia is really great uh anything that has different shaped flowers so some that are tubular some that open like the daisies in australia we have the most daisy species in the world and that's because we've got a lot of native pollinators that love sitting on a daisy in fact inside the daisy all those yellow bits are tiny little individual flowers so just thinking again also of those humble shaped flower heads where the bees or our butterflies get a lot of um, energy and, and food from a small area and of course you know if you ever had, are growing some good carrots i know you guys have got sandy soil uh let a carrot go to flower. They have amazing flower heads and all the beneficial insects just love feasting on the nectar on those guys. Um, and, of course, yeah, try and try and chat to your local community garden. They're pretty savvy. And, and just try and, you know what I love to do? I don't like giving neighbours bunches of flowers. I give them a plant from my garden. And it's really important. If you someone sees you at the front of your house doing a bit of gardening, Give them a plant because then you're starting the conversation saying, hey, we need more flowers in the neighbourhood for our bees, for our pollination. Because a lot of people become so disconnected with growing vegetables and having flowers or turf and succulents and yuccas and no flowers. We've got to go back to the messy gardens. We've got to go back to grandma style gardening. And we've got to talk to the neighbours like your rental person, whoever had that. Give them some flowers from your garden. And lots of these flowers like salvias, when I when I cruise around the neighbourhood, budley is a really great one for butterflies, very easy to propagate. Just have a go, you know. Now's the time. I've taken some tip cuttings of my lavender. And last week, my five-year-old, we shoved out in tin cans nine rosemary little plants and they all went. Now, I've provided more bee food in the neighbourhood. Just give it a go. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, Katrina, your enthusiasm for pollinate, pollinators is so infectious. So I hope everybody else is feeling that as well and planning to go out this weekend and, and plant some flowers for our, our beneficial insects. Um, we probably, there's no more questions in the chat and no one's got their hand up, so we might wrap up shortly. Um, Katrina, I did want to say thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, such a, a wealth of information there. Um, before we go, I just want to remind everybody in the email I sent out today with your link, um, all of the, there's two PDFs and two links that Katrina um, shared with you. So that's all in your email. So please feel free to have a look. Um, and the last thing I'd do want to just mention, I'm going to pop in a link um, in the chat to our upcoming Envirus Centre events. Um, it's libraries.hobsonsbay.vic.gov.au. Um, we have some amazing events coming up, so please jump on the website and have a look. Uh, next week, we've got how to mindfully declutter and reduce waste. So this one's all about not just chucking everything out to landfill, but how to declutter your house in a really intentional way, uh, making sure that you, you're not creating more landfill. And also, uh, Tanya will be talking a little bit about how, how, how we change our mindset to not create the clutter in the first place by thinking about what we buy. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one next week. The week after, we've got a session on mindfulness, particularly in this time, and connecting into mindfulness in nature. So what can we do on our one-hour walks around our suburban area? We know we're not kind of getting out as much as we do normally. What can we do in the areas around us, in our backyards, on our lo local walks? Um, and then on the first week of October, we've got DIY natural beauty products as well. So they're just the next three coming up. Um, we've got events all the way through um, one a week until the first week of November. So there's lots on there. Jump on our website and have a look. Um, but Katrina, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for all of your information and for sharing those resources with us as well. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. If you have any feedback, feel free to reply to the email I sent to you today. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Um, and hopefully we'll have some books out to your homes in our delivery soon as well, if you live within Hobson's Bay. <laughs> and <laughs> I pop some links to our to that book in the chat as well to our catalog. We do have that one in our collection, and I pop some links to some of our other um, books in the link as well. I shared my favourite insect book, um, and I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> despite it being my favourite, it is um, the little things that run the city. Thirty amazing insects um, from Melbourne, and that was made by Melbourne Museum. It's a really have a great. great great little that one so thank you very much we'll see you next time and um stay safe out there guys thank bye. you bye <laughs>